Hello again, I'm Doug Smith, and welcome to Portsmouth this week. Today is the 20th of February, 2015, and uh, our guest today is uh, our Department of Public Works Director, Dave Kehu. Welcome back, Dave. Thank you and very our, much. Our main topic is going to be the transfer station repairs. Okay. But before I, we get to that, I'd like to publicly thank you and all your guys, uh, your public works crews, for their work and their efforts in keeping our roads open. Uh, th these guys did a great job, I think, and yeah. please thank them for me. Uh, uh, and we'll do that. Speaking of that snow stuff, <laughs> can you give me some idea of the scope of the plow uh, plowing and snow removal stuff over the last couple of weeks? Yeah, um, I actually took some notes down from uh, basically January 26th, uh, Juno blizzard, and then up to date as of yesterday. And, uh, you know, Brian and I, we got about 200 hours in uh, of, you know, that's beyond the regular 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., and that's in a short amount of time. Average guy. And that's that we in have less working, than a month. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so our average guy's uh, about 160 hours Jeez. of uh, time behind wow. the wheel, uh, and that's uh, over through. And I met with uh, uh, finance director James Lathrop and uh, my boss, town administrator uh, John Clem, this morning, and he was going to give a uh, talk about the budget a little bit uh, Monday. And, you know, so he wants to know, hey, where are we at and, you know, where are our costs? Yeah. And, uh, Without, I know we, we don't have a lot of time, so basically right now, as of uh, yesterday, uh, we're at 90644.92 to the penny, uh, okay. over budget. And uh, we have upcoming storms. Uh, Mr. Clem understands that. Uh, he's been through this before, so he knows the numbers and was not surprised. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it is a, uh, an overlying uh, budget item. Absolutely, but it's one of those things that you got to do it anyway. So no matter what, it, you know, you come up with the money. That's what reserves are for and things like that, I think. Yeah. So so long as you're, you know, uh, And you guys doing are probably smart, much more you know? efficient than most of these guys. I think, uh, I think we other, are. Yeah. I think we are. Well, I think you are, too. Let me get back to our main topic. Yeah. Uh, we we only have we, we only have about half of the show today for you. I don't know why, but uh, uh, we want to talk about the, the town transfer station right. and uh, the repairs that it needs. And I wonder if you could tell us something about the condition of the station and why it needs repairs. We got a few photos that you sent us. Yeah, um, I'll just talk to a few of those maybe. Sure. Uh, well, everybody who goes to the transfer station uh, located off Headley Street uh, is well aware uh, of the building itself. Uh, there's basically four main floor-to-roof trusses inside the building. It's a very simple, it's not a complex building whatsoever. Uh, the electrical is a little bit, but uh, you know, you can see the rot uh, on that. Uh, here's a picture, right? Yep. And right in here, you can see the, uh, yeah. the, the girts, right? And the physical connection to the steel, to the concrete, is gone. So that's just flapping in the breeze. Yeah. And then this right here on that side where you see that cone, uh, that's essentially facing uh, the east side of the building. So, and there's that door, which is on the east side. And so everything that's supposed to be attached and fastened mechanically is no longer there. So it's basically uh, not in good shape. It's not in good shape. And then we have all the roof purlins. And uh, two, uh, as I say, there's four uh, major structural beams that go from you know, span 50 foot, 20 foot high. And the two in the middle uh, have been throughout the years hit by trucks and so forth. And so a structural engineer is not going to uh, say those are good. So those have to be replaced. So the idea is to, uh, two options, which uh, we included. I just finished the RFP yeah. last night. Okay, I, guess we're, that's I think I, yeah, I handed this in yesterday, okay. sometime yesterday. Uh, I had a draft one and kind of finished it up. But uh, so what we're looking at is two different things. One is retrofitting. So take the skin off the roof, the siding, um, take all the purlins and the two trusses that are twisted, remove them, install the two, put new skin on, meaning the, the sidewall, metal panels, and new roof, insulate it, put the bird protection on, and use a galvaline finish so we don't get rusted on the bottom. Um, with that, you know, we have three phase 480 uh, power coming into the build and the line is low. And uh, when that was built, we were close to 40 years ago now. Uh, so nothing was weatherproof as far as the electrical. The upgrades that we've done throughout the years are, 
but what is existing is not. So there's quite a bit of electrical uh, upgrading to do. They'll de-energize the building. Uh, so as I see it, they'll end up uh, taking the power out of the building, putting in generators to power up the two compactors, uh, and then have another generator for lighting. So we'll close Monday, Tuesday, excuse me, we'll work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and You'll that's in work. the RFP. Right. The contractors. So, okay, so, they will, so it's a the three-day work will not week. Be able to use public the won't, but uh, we've already spoke with uh, Patriot, um, and uh, they're willing to accommodate that schedule. So we're not really losing hours because we'll be open uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay, so they will be open Sunday, so that's basically one day less than they're normally open. Well, a little two, bit. It three. adds up being a little bit more yeah. than that because you know Wednesday they were shut down yeah. anyway. So yeah. I've lost two days. So the idea is to make up those uh, two days, one of which was a 7:30 to 7 p.m. So that that is covered in there. Okay. Now in the RFP, the the, the one I saw earlier, at least uh, another option was to replace the building. Right, and so, uh, so that is still in there. Okay. And uh, you know, if we can, if a company comes in and says, hey let's not fool around with anything here let's go in uh, and at which point then I make the decision that forget 20 foot you know bump it up four five feet uh, I put five in the proposal to make it higher so that way we never have to worry about a truck dumping and hitting a truss again uh, even though that would be under their insurance you know yeah. if you can uh, include that in from the beginning you know you're much better off so uh, that's in there, and you know we're asking, hey, if you can put a new building up, and it's you know uh, the town council will look at it and say, I want the new, or I want the retrofit. Essentially, the retrofit is giving you a new building, uh, you know, because it's all new roof, it's all new skin, it's yeah. all new purlins, it's all new girts, and uh, so. But if that price is you know close to it, it'll be up for the council to say, yeah, we'll go for the new. Uh, and again, this is using the same foundation. So we're not into concrete, we're not into site work. You know, this is a right. uh, quick assembly. Uh, you kind of, it's kind of like an industrial building. It's basically a, a metal. They've all were framed. built. A, a ton of these were built out there, and uh, uh, and I found out through this process that th these companies are geared up that put these up and replacing them. So this isn't like unique. They've all you know put them up 40, 37 years ago, and they're all failing at the same time. So they know that, and they they know exactly what to do. They uh, have done that. They can work a three-day schedule, and uh, so that's good. The RFP, uh, talking to the finance director this morning, we're looking at uh, having that go out like a March time frame. Then April, we'll get everything in, select the contractor who ha you know puts forth the best RFP, best proposal, and then May would be construction. I had a estimated, uh, you know, three-day work week. And I ended up saying two months, so about two months, in order to get that part of the work done, along with the electrical. Um, so that that's about where. So you look at an early June, maybe if everything works out. Yes. Or, or if it takes that long, because yep. maybe it won't. If they, somebody decides to do a new one, it might be quicker. It, it could it could be quicker. Um, you know, I, I, I was custom home builder, didn't fool around with metal, so uh, I really don't know. I know it's quick. I know yeah. it's very quick. Well, you know, obviously some of these problems at that, uh, at that uh, transfer station have been around for some time. And I guess my question is, why are we, why are we looking at this thing now to repair it? The, the reason we're looking at, uh, well, one, you know, it's not safe. Uh, you know, but it wasn't safe probably last year either. Right. Yeah. But uh, so, you know, you know, from a, a standpoint of a transfer station, you know, most people would say it's functionally obsolete. Uh, however, uh, it's the will that everybody... People yeah. love the transfer station. They love the setup, and uh, so you have to account for that. And uh, you know, so the decision you know had to be made: is, is this something we want to keep yeah. and have opened, or do you want to shut it down? And uh, you know, the decision maker said, "Well, we want to keep it." And you know, so then it's on my plate. Well, how do we? Yeah. Do well, there, that? as you said before, there there have been other schemes, uh, pay as you throw, the rest of this, these kind of things that right. are now bubbling up again. Right. Uh, that would obviate the need to. To, to repair this thing, but uh, not so much pay as you throw, because that would still be uh, that, that still utilized. uses right. this. Yeah. Um, the only way you get out of this is you know having pickup. Uh, yeah. You know, and uh, this is still that's the one bang of my pet peeves that I won't go there today. But uh, yeah. yeah. No, but this is the bang for the buck. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're looking to 
you know, have a facility that your residents can use and take care of their own trash, this is less expensive than it is uh, yeah. under enterprise fund, even doing capital repair. Yeah, I, I think this takes us back to our colonial roots or something, you know, something we can do that's cheap when we do it ourselves and we know it's done. But, yeah. you know, uh, what's the current, so, so, the, so the RFP is basically finished. It's going to go out shortly. Yep, it'll be out uh, March, and you know I, I forget all of the uh, yeah, legal, well, legal the, the, financial. Yeah, the dates. You know, it's got to be out uh, you know, advertised for X amount of time right. to hit all the requirements, okay. and then you know the selection will be reviewing. You know we don't know if we're going to have uh, uh, you know three or if we're going to have twenty uh, review yeah. you know, RFPs to review, yeah. and. Uh, Absolutely. So, and then construction would be like that May uh, time frame. Okay. So you have uh, three, six, nine, twelve, twelve working days. That's not going to do it. So that's why I figure, you know, yeah. uh, a couple of months. Okay. Uh, now, to put it together. Uh, uh, how much is it going to cost us? Do you think, or what is what's in the RFP in terms of money, and and how is it funded? There's, when I went before the council, um, when I originally uh, put this, you know, as a budgetary item. I had uh, money in there for uh, structural plans, was able to put that onus on the bidder, saying, whatever you present to us, it has to be a stamped by a Rhode Island registered uh, professional uh, structural engineer. And uh, so we saved ourselves money on that part by just incorporating it into the RFP. Then um, I, I just lost my train of thought. Doug, they've been uh, up a lot of hours here. The, the funding and the cost. So the funding, uh, the cost. Um, I'm going to say, uh, I'm guessing that we're probably going to have somewhere about 30k uh, just on electrical, on the electrical side. And that uh, that's what was new. That's what you added to. That's the you know, RFP. yeah. I kind of want to kept that out of this so it didn't yeah. get complicated. And hey, here's electrical. But you know the the rules and regulations. You know, yeah, we just that's can't okay. pick so, who we yeah. want, and you know we have to meet the litmus test. So, sure. uh, so we put it in the RFP, and certainly I know you know what to do and how to guide uh, and help. You know how is this going to be working? Uh, National Grid's another entity. Uh, once this building gets de-energized, uh, they're not going to re-energize it. So I know that uh, ahead of time. So that's why we're going to switch. Now, to when the they de-energize it, it can't be used. No, it will be used, or, or but we'll we be running off of generators. Off generators. Off okay. generators. Powering, uh, you know, the three phase, that's okay. for down below. That's for the motors yeah, down the below. And, yeah. you know, that's, uh, that's a lot of, you can't fool with it. You know, yeah. it's three phase, you know, sure. so, uh, so that's got to be done 100%, you know. Uh, okay, so correct. the total cost of the project about? So I'm going to say total cost of the project without getting in, there's an office in there. Those controls are old. I'm not putting that in now. Uh, there's some, uh, work down below that uh, I think is needed. We're not going to put that in there now. Um, I'm going to say we're going to be, well, 30 on electrical and then uh, about 120 to 130 on the building. So probably 155, 160, somewhere in there. All right, so less than 200,000 bucks. Oh, yeah. I yeah. thought it was going to be more than that. So I, well, you know, original went for the council was, you know, if we're going to do this, do you want to extend it? Do you want to make it bigger? Do you want yeah. to try to put retaining walls? Um, and so uh, didn't get that vibe back saying <laughs> this is the footprint okay, and well, they want hey, to work with that. Whatever works. Listen, so, we're almost out of time. We always do this with you. Yeah. And I want you to have one last shot at what do you want to tell people in Portsmouth for the next couple of weeks to help you guys clear the snow and stuff? Um, quickly, you got 20 seconds. Well, quickly, <laughs> for, I want to thank my men uh, yeah, for absolutely. doing all that they've done, and we appreciate your thoughts on them. Uh, for our residents, uh, they've been very good. This, you, know, we, you would think I would be, you know, uh, killed with complaints. I have about 400 calls, and not all of them are friendly, but, uh, you know, I would just ask them to let our plow operators do their job and uh, uh, help us instead of hurting us. Okay. Dave, thanks very much for coming on today. Right. Always a pleasure. Well, again, this is the second segment of uh, Portsmouth This Week on the 20th of February, 2015. Our special guest today is Ashley Kuzmenko, who is the Director of Development at Boys Town, New England, which is headquartered here in Portsmouth. Uh, welcome, Ashley. Thank you. Uh, I wonder, if, to begin with, if you give us a little background on Boys Town in general and, you know, like, 
what you do, how you organize, that kind of stuff? Absolutely. Boys Town was started actually in 1917 in Omaha, Nebraska by a Catholic priest named Father Flanagan. Yeah. He was working with uh, men in the justice system and really saw that there was a need for boys. So this was during the Depression and um, children were living on the streets. They had nowhere to go. So he opened Father Flanagan's Boys Home to help these children and give them a place to live. Now, almost 100 years later, uh, we have 11 sites around the country, one of which is actually right here in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Yeah. And we opened our doors in 1991. And what we do here is a little different than, than what they did in 1917. And then we have multiple programs that help multiple children and families throughout the state of Rhode Island and into southeastern Mass. And I'm sure Mass. it now includes girls and as it, well as boys. It does include girls now, yeah. yes. Uh, since the late 70s, early 80s, we've been taking girls. Yeah. Um, and we did change our name for a little while there to Girls and Boys Town, and we get mixed up with the, the Boys and Girls Club a lot, so we went back. Yeah, well, I think I told you my father was a lifelong supporter of uh, mm -hmm. Father Flanagan and Boys Town. Uh, who are your clients, and how do they get into this program? Absolutely. So most of our clients are referred to us through the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. And we take children um, ages 0 to 18 in our programs, and we um, also help their parents as well. So our kids, majority, are children who have been removed from their home due to abuse and neglect and either need somewhere safe to stay, so they come to our campus in Portsmouth, or they go to one of our many fo foster homes in Rhode Island in southeastern Mass, or um, we work with their families while the child's still in the home or working to get back to the home because we really want to make sure that we're helping to heal that whole whole unit to bring families back together. So the, there's a whole spectrum here of, there of, is. of help here that's available. Mm -hmm. uh, and and w what ages are your, are your kids? Are they all ages? They're all ages, actually. Yeah. Um, here on our campus in Portsmouth, we have five homes. We have two homes for little guys, and they're co-ed, boys and girls and their children who are their large sibling sets that we can't find a, a foster home that can take all, all three or four of them together, um, or their kids that have a little bit higher needs. And we also have three adolescent boys homes on our campus, and that's ages about 10 to 12 to 18 years old. Um, and the great thing about our homes here in Portsmouth are they're run by a married couple. So although a child um, might not be in a foster home, we can give them a home-like setting with a family. Yeah, so each of, the, each of the homes is kind of like a mom and dad to yeah. kind of take care of. That's great. Yeah. I think that's super. Uh, uh, what kind of, where, where do these, these folks come from, the people that are, you know, the, uh, running the houses? They How do you find these people? It, it's, it's difficult, and we're always looking for great families that want to do this work. It's, it's not easy, so I'm they're, sure they're isn't. very, very special Trying people. Trying to raise your own kids is hard enough. <laughs> right. <laughs> and actually, some of them have their own biological children, too. So they have yeah. six boys town kids and two of their own. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty large family. But they come from all over. We have a couple right here who is a local couple, um, and we have some that moved all the way from Washington State. So it, it's a pretty large span and we do national searches for for people. Wow, that, that's great. How many children do you have in residence now? About? So in that program we, we probably have about five or six in each home so anywhere from 25 to 30 kids on the campus and that's actually one of our smaller programs uh, throughout the state we have about 40 foster homes and we're always looking for more foster families. Um, some here are right here locally, others are um, in er different areas. And we even take foster parents into southeastern Mass to help those children. Um, and, and a foster parent is somebody who still lives in their own home and just takes on that child with their own family in their own home. Yeah, I'll come back to this, but I think uh, I wanted to make sure people looked at the telephone number that's up on the screen now because uh, in case they're interested in learning more, perhaps, or right. maybe even thinking about trying to do some of this stuff, which really helps out kids, you know. Yes, yes. Uh, but I'll come back to that at the <laughs> end as well. Um, where do they go to school? Are they go to the local schools, I assume, right? They do. So um, if, if they're in here at our uh, campus, the majority will go to Portsmouth schools. Uh, some do go to some specialized learning environments, but the majority are here in Portsmouth. And then whatever town or area they are in foster care. Yeah. Now, what is the goal of the program to try to kind of get everybody back in an even keel or? or so there, it depends on the child and the family. Um, and you know, I spoke of our residential campus here um, and our foster care and, and we also have what we call in-home family services and visitation services that help families who are either trying to reunify back together or um, have a child in the home and they're at risk of losing that child and being placed outside the home so we work with them and then we have our parenting classes as well. So 
the goal are all different based on the individual yeah. family. Well, I guess what I'm thinking is when I think of when I think of the place, I think mostly of the homes. Right. And uh, and the five houses you have mm -hmm. there. Uh, typically, how long does a kid stay there? It all depends. We've had kids stay a few days. We've had them stay a few months, um, and I think we have a few who have been there about a year and a half. So we get children two ways um, through the. Um, DCYF in that they've been abused or neglected and need, need a safe place to stay. We also get boys who are through the juvenile justice system. Uh, so it all depends on how well they're doing in the program um, and how other well families are doing outside. Uh, a lot of our children, we try to reunify back with mom and dad or grandma or, or wherever they came from, their guardian, but sometimes that's not possible. So we do have kids that are waiting for uh, adoptive homes. So they're they don't have anywhere to go and they need an adoptive yeah. family. And we have kids who are waiting for foster homes as well. Now, are those adoptive homes at a premium kind of? Uh, you know, a lot of them are older boys and it's really hard to find a foster home or a pre-adoptive home for yeah. a teenager. Uh, so, so they really need... Well, it, it seems like you're looking at two sides of, this, of the same coin, abusive parents and abusive kids. I mean, you know... In, in a sense, yeah. yeah. I always say that um, our kids who are older boys who have come through the juvenile justice system are, are kids that were probably just like our little ones who were in home environments that weren't healthy. Yeah. And, and, they're the, and that's the result of eventually of, of abuse at, at home. Yeah. Uh, and and w what you're trying to do is kind of show them that you can live in a nice you know place and people can be nice to each other and exactly uh, uh, we we have um, the specially trained couple that lives in the home and for many of these kids they've never they might not have had a mom and a dad they might not have sat down for for a family dinner or um, had a homework time there's no structure and consistency so we really try to bring them into a different environment and, and give them tools that they can take after they leave here and that's why the kids do go to public school and that's why our campus is open and we bring guests and visitors because anybody could do well in a vacuum or a bubble yeah. but we have to make sure that we're train we're teaching them and we actually have a um, evidence-based teaching model uh, that has been research driven and proven to actually be effective in helping well, children that's the nice in thing care. About being part of this big organization mm -hmm. I think you've got some it is. Good background to draw from. It is, and all of our, our staff are trained. We all go to Omaha, actually, for at least two weeks, <laughs> too. To we go downtown camp. Omaha, not in the winter, I hope. <laughs> Although Sometimes. it would be just like this, probably. <laughs> it is. It's pretty cold out yeah. there. So, so the, the kids that are here in these, in these homes is kind of a temporary, Yes. And, and they know that. Yes. So they know they're there, they know they're there, and hopefully they're, they're open to learning stuff, to mm -hmm. kind of changing their behavior and maybe their expectations. Yeah. Uh, and uh, have you ever had any, any kids that have stayed longer, like, you know, several months or a year or anything like that? We have. Right now we have a few that have been with us for a significant amount of time. I mean, there's nothing time. wrong with it. I'm just, nope. just curious. And it's usually a situational thing um, in that, like I said, we're looking for a foster home for them because they, they can't go back yeah. home to their parents and that there's just a lack of foster homes right now in the state of yeah. Rhode Island. Um, that's... The one thing that's, that's going to really be very needed. tough to do, boy. I don't envy your job there doing that. But uh, yeah. uh, what about money? How are you guys funded? So we're funded uh, two ways, three ways really. Um, for every child that we have in care, the state does give us a per day per diem rate. Uh, we also are fortunate enough to have um, a portion of our funding come from our national office through Father the Father Flanagan Fund, and then I do fundraising locally okay. to fill that gap. Uh, next time you do fundraising, come in the program, and we'll try to give you some airtime at least. To, yeah, that'd be great. To advertise some of this stuff. What kind of outstanding needs do you have right now? I mean, that you can think of. There, there are just so many. Like I said, first of all, foster parents. If anybody is interested or curious, or just wants to know about it, right? Yeah. Just give us a call. You know, it's a great opportunity to learn. Um, we have people who will, will sit down and talk to you and, and just to start the process. And if you're not interested after you learn, that's okay. But just getting the word out about foster care. Um, and I also like to always talk about our Common Sense Parenting classes. They're an amazing class using our research-driven, evidence-proven yeah. program. And we're teaching those all over the state. They're either very low cost or no cost at all for families who um, just need help. And you don't have to be in DCYF or have any problems. They're just a good tool for any yeah, parent. Yeah, well, I wish, I wish I had known about that when my kids were smaller because uh, 
there's no such thing as common sense sometimes. <laughs> right. It gets, it gets, <laughs> I think that's why they, they call it that. it's tough on all sides, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, for fundraising, um, we always need um, donations, uh, especially, you know, monetary are great because we can use it to fill the need that, that's there. But we also have, um, you know, we do gifts and kind donations. Um, we have our upcoming gala. So local businesses will sometimes give us gift cards or... Well, okay. Well, give me, an, give me an example of, like, gifts in kind. A gift in kind is anything that's not a monetary or money. Uh, so it could be uh, new clothes for children, socks, underwear, uh, PJs are always huge, brand new things like that because we have kids coming into us day and night. Yeah. And if nothing else, at least we can give them a fresh set of clothes because a lot of times they're coming to us with just the clothes on their back and, yeah. and a little bag. Sure. Um, toiletry products are always great as well uh, for our homes on campus. Um, bedding, uh, blankets, you know, with the turnover of children, we yeah. always try to keep our homes really nice and clean and, and give everybody something How about new. about food or anything like that? Are you guys pretty well set? Um, we outside? do have a budget, so our family teachers do um, come and, and, and buy their, they, they have their budget, they buy their food. But for our in-home families, the families that we actually go into the community and serve in their homes, a lot of them are well below the poverty line and really having a hard time. Yeah. So our, our in-home always asks for canned goods and things that if, just in case they say, hey, we're short this month, we can help them. The other thing is gift cards. So stop and shop yeah. or Those, those Walmart, are easy to do now. They're easy. And, and if a family says, you know, we're really low on budget, we can't buy groceries or, or we really need this, we can help them by giving, yeah. giving them that service. I think that's great. Are, are there any opportunities for volunteers to help out? Yes, yes. Okay, um, and I'm sure you'll tell me what they are. Right? Absolutely, there there are multiple. We a lot of times get large groups. Some of them aren't as fun as people want them to be. It's sometimes you know work. Yeah. So gardening in the we've 18 acres, um, and one one great maintenance guy who works. Um, oh, with so you us. guys have you grow your own food a little bit, huh? Uh, sometimes we do yeah. have we um have sometimes have some gardens and um but we try to keep the campus nice and it's not always easy when you only have one person doing it so. We like to get groups together. Okay, so gardening we, gardening, we have some fixes for that, but go ahead, what else? Um, we also, um, sometimes like organizing donations, because uh, we do get a lot, and we need to go through them and make sure yeah, everything's sure. appropriate. Um, and then sometimes we're always asking for if, if somebody wants to come and do some office work, clerical kind of things, have some experience. Yeah. And then we do have a small group of people who will come and tutor the kids. Our kids are always behind in score, or some, a lot of them are significantly yeah. behind and need some help. Um, or, you know, sometimes we'll have people who come and read to the little ones once a day yeah. or, or hang out and give, give them some extra one-on-one -on -one attention. So there's, there's plenty of opportunity here. Yes. You know, we're almost out of time, which we usually are in these interesting programs like this. Uh, people can find out more about Boys Town, but they can call that number, uh, and I'm sure you guys can tell a little bit more about it. I would heartily recommend people go down and, and visit because yes. you're such a friendly place to go. And I think in the springtime, maybe we can come down there and do some filming on site and yeah, show people what a lovely facility you have there. We'd love that. Yeah, just give us a call um, or go to our website, which is um, www.boystown.org backslash new dash Okay, England. I think we had that in one of the earlier things. Anyway, uh, thanks very much for coming in. Well, thank and you. I hope we see more of you in the future. And for those of you that think have some time to volunteer, this is a really good cause. So give it a shot. Thank you again. Doug Smith, over and out. I'll see you next time.